chapter that we've started. Mm -hmm. okay, so we are live. Yeah, I did it in Instagram in, in advance today. And I was like, who are we? I know. I, I actually scheduled the live show like last night so people could turn notifications on. I'm like, look at me being a professional. <laughs> I, I actually scheduled the live show like last night so people could turn notifications on. I'm like, look at being the, a professional. Okay, that's better. The tab, I know. Okay, so let me go to the actual YouTube page. And. Okay. So I will grab that. should work. Okay. I just saw recently that they they're not doing the Costa Book Award anymore. Mm. Which mm. is sad that it's like we're doing the one that won an award for our live show this month but it's an, it's an odd company to do a book award it really is yeah because like the first time i really knew to pay attention to it was when i was in ireland for my semester and because like we don't have like costas here and i was like like the coffee shop like <laughs> it was just very interesting but I mean, I think it was, it was exciting that an author that I, you know, had loved for a while, like won, and people are saying it's, it's too bad because it's one of the only awards that includes like genre fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what people said. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah. And I, when I was sort of putting to the notes together for this, there was a lot of stuff about how like a, a children's book won it. And that's quite unusual as well. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, we're going to talk about the award in a bit. Cool. Because I have thoughts. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. We might have some of the same thoughts. <laughs> okay. We can give it a minute or so more. And then we'll do intros. I'll message Julia in case she was planning. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mary Margaret. <laughs> We're excited you're here. Yeah, I'll message Kimberly as well, just in case, because she hasn't, I don't think she said this time whether she could or couldn't. Okay. I know she's in Australia, right? So I know that's going to be so I'm not sure. an odd times, time for her. Here she is. Hello. Hello. So glad to have you. Um, okay, shall we do intros? If Julia comes, she'll know them anyway. <laughs> she knows who we are, yeah. <laughs> um, 
All right. So, Cara, do you want to introduce a general introduction about yourself? Maybe briefly introduce your history with Francis Harding since we have been on hiatus and then um, uh, recommend a favourite book that you've read in the last few months while we've been away. Cool. All right. Hi, everyone. So my name is Cara. My channel is Wild Book Garden. Um, just as a refresher, Francis Harding has been one of my favourite authors for quite a while now. Um, one of my favorite underrated authors. I feel like she doesn't get as much attention as she deserves. Um, and I actually had read most of her books before. Um, there's only one that we've read so far that I hadn't read before. Um, and then I haven't read her two newest ones. But other than that, I've read all her books, some of them multiple times. Um, so it's been really exciting. Like some of these I haven't read in more than five years, I think. So it's been really fun to get to return to them. Um, and discuss them in detail and hopefully introduce more people to them. Um, and then as for a book that I loved during our hiatus, I, okay, so I was going to say Firekeeper's Daughter because I finally read it and I'm kind of obsessed with it, but I think a lot of people know about that one. So that's like my, my honorable mention. Um, I want to mention Not Here to Be Liked by Michelle Kwok. Um, it's a contemporary novel that I don't think I've seen anyone talk about, at least that I follow. Um, and it's one of my favorite contemporaries. I think it was really well done. We follow a main character who is on her school newspaper and they're doing elections for, I think like editor in chief or something like that. And she knows she's the most qualified. She's basically running unopposed. So there's no reason she shouldn't get it until this like ex jock, who like just barely jo joined the paper is like, I'm going to run too. And he wins. And the reason everybody gives is that like, he's more of a leader and all this stuff. Uh, that makes it pretty clear that they don't like that Eliza, the main character, is very confident and um, very capable, that she's not like, she doesn't really placate people when she talks about her opinions. And because she's a girl, they don't like that. Um, and so Eliza is understandably very upset. And she writes this really scathing takedown of the sexism in her school, even for things that are supposedly meritocracies, like the paper. Um, and she's not intending to publish it, but she just like needs to get her feelings out. Somebody else posts it online and it kind of goes viral. And so now she's sort of like leading this feminist movement at her school that she did not intend to. Um, and she gets paired to work on newspaper stories with the guy who took her job. And I just think it was so well done. Like I was excited about it, but I was nervous about the premise because um, she ends up developing romantic feelings for this guy. And I'm like, how are you gonna make a romance happen between like the main character and the guy who like stole the job that she should have had? But I think the author did a really good job with it. Um, I feel like he was really well written. I think we got to understand more about him and why he did the things he did while also not letting him off the hook for like not speaking up earlier. Um, I just love the way this book talks about feminism and how we can all feel like bad feminists and like the different ways that you can be a strong woman. Like this book really pushes back about against the like not like other girls idea. Um, Cause Eliza has to realize like one of the girls who gets really involved with the feminist movement is like the preppy popular like cheerleader girl. And when she first joins the, the group, Eliza's kind of like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and so she has to realize that she's been doing the same thing to girls, like judging them based on like stereotypes and appearances and it's just really well done. Um, yeah, I've talked a lot about it already, but like really loved it. Highly recommend, even if um, young adult contemporary is not normally your thing, I feel like this is a really good one that you might enjoy. So yes, love that. Yeah, I remember your review of that one. It sounds really good. Very good. Yeah, and hi everyone. Um, I'm Hannah. As like Cara, I've also been a fan of Francis Harding for a long time um, and this uh, this project has been the first time for me rereading quite a lot of her books, which has been really nice, and also some new ones. I'd only read about half of her work before we started. Um, I had read this one before, but we'll get to that. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, a book that I wanted to recommend is A Kind of Spark by Elle McNichol, because I feel like Frances Harding readers will also really enjoy that one. Um, it's a middle grade contemporary about a an autistic girl whose teacher is really awful um, and they are learning about witch trials um, in their village and she's really upset about the witch trials and doesn't understand why everyone else around her isn't as upset as she is um, and it's just really wonderful and I loved her family relationships and the kind of the depiction of how how empathetic she is and how many feelings she has um, and it was just, yeah, I cried through the whole thing and it was just really wonderful and I highly recommend it. 
Yes. Yes. I loved that one too. <laughs> I'm glad you picked that one. That was, I, I was thinking about selecting that one when you told me about it. So I'm glad you got to talk about it. Yeah. So good. I want to like read everything that she's written now. Yeah. Yeah. Her, the author's second book is on my July TBR and I'm very excited. Um, Okay, and before we get into the whole discussion, um, content warnings for this discussion will probably be murder, death of a parent, grief, misogyny, potentially fire, and references to suicide, um, just so everyone's aware. And then, yeah, we can get into, so overall thoughts on the book, um, your history with it, because this is one that we had both read before, whether your feelings have changed, star rating, if you feel it's relevant. <laughs> I like that you always add that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so for a while, this is probably the one of the Francis Hardy books I've reread the most often. Um, and for a while, I considered this one of my favorites from her. And after reading this in connection with like all the other ones we've reread from her so far, I don't know that it's one of my favorite by her favorites by her anymore. But I think it has some of my favorite scenes in it, which I think is maybe why it stands out in my memory as being a favorite. Like, I think... I don't know, I think the themes are less subtle here than in her mm -hmm. other books, but I think some of that makes sense for the time period as well. Um, it's just like, I'm not used to it being so on the nose, but, and I also think it's interesting that Faith is like the nastiest, I think, main character. But again, I understand why, like she just feels very, um, I don't know, it's like she's responding in horrible ways, but they're very believable. So I have like very interesting mixed feelings about this one. I did give it four stars. I did really enjoy it. Um, it's definitely not my like least favorite by her, but yeah, it, it's interesting coming back to it after a few years now, cause it's been a little while since I've reread it. And yeah, I think my general impression is like, it has some of my favorite scenes in it, but after rereading her others, I don't know, like I, it's not one of my favorites from her anymore. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel similar i think i liked it less than you did um i so we initially agreed i'm not sure if we've said this sort of in public but we agreed that i would host this one because this one was my least favorite in my memory and that hasn't changed um <laughs> and i think i liked it less i read it uh quite soon after it was published so 2015 and i haven't read it since and i think i like it less now than i did then um, I guess in comparison to her other books. Um, hi Kelly, I've just seen that Kelly's here as well. Um, Hello. And yeah, I gave it three to three and a half-ish. And I think even the fact that I'm considering a three and a half is because I have so much affection for France Harding generally. And if it had been by an author I didn't care about, it would have been a solid three at the most. Um, yeah, it was, so, a struggle to get through it in some places um but yeah and I also think that I'm more frustrated with it because it is the book that won the award um yeah. and it's the one that like kick-started I feel like she had been nominated for some awards but I feel like it was after this one that she got to be really well known and like you know started doing like school visits and stuff yeah. and I just I'm annoyed by that because her other books were so much better yeah yeah like I'm not in a way I'm not surprised this is the one that won because it's the very I don't know it, it does things that award books tend to do and I feel like it's it's like a very obvious message of like feminism and everything which is not a bad thing but like I think her other books do it in such a more subtle way that yeah it is kind of frustrating that this is the one that won when I don't think I think even when I considered it one of my favorites I don't know that it would have been the one I would pick for an award necessarily but yeah I, th I feel like I can yeah I can see why it did because arguably it's, arguably it's the least weird um you know the writing is <laughs> a bit less flowery the plot a bit more straightforward the characters are you know like there's none of the weird names and you know kind of stuff like that but that's what I like about her writing <laughs> so, yeah. I like the weirdness yeah <laughs> but yeah okay so let's start with thoughts on the setting um and the historical period um thoughts on you know why she set it there what how you think it comes across yeah I I think she definitely was very intentional about 
the time and place that she said it because this is like when on the origin of species was like just published and it was um obviously a huge deal i think that was a really interesting part of the book in the way that it affected like the the lie tree itself and then obviously faith as a character and like her father and everything um it's interesting like reading this book because like my parents are both archaeologists and so like the the like evolution slash science or religion that dichotomy has never made made sense for me mm -hmm. i understand that at the time it, it was a big deal and like it would have felt like you had to choose one or the other um so like i think like the setting i feel like really fed into that that theme that she wanted to explore which again makes sense for the time period but it just wasn't as subtle as um as her books usually are i feel like i'm talking about the themes instead of the <laughs> the setting and the time period yeah um, yeah no, i had the same like francis harding clearly doesn't believe in religion um which we talked about a little bit when we read fly by night as well i think um and like it's very obvious <laughs> <laughs> i yeah and i think like it's interesting because in some of her other books it's it's more balanced like the perspective um and this one, it, it just felt very like you have to pick one or the other, which for the time period makes sense. But like for publishing a book now, I don't know that it does. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I guess, but yeah, so I think we talked last time about um, how she likes setting books during times of change, um, mm -hmm. which this definitely was, um, as we discussed a little bit. Hi, Julia. Hello. Yeah, it is definitely a time of change. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I saw an interview where she said that she set it here because, you know, the the lies and the like the idea of respectability and scandal was such a a bigger thing um, yeah. than it is now, perhaps. Um, which I think was interesting. And I I I like the setting and the general vibe of the the island and yeah, I did like the island. It's like very suited to like creepy stuff that's very normal. Like, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like that that contrast between like respectability and everything, but also possible murderers are hanging out mm -hmm. here. Like, yeah, I thought it was interesting how like isolated it was. Also, not because they get news from the mainland, yes. but you know, it's not it's not quite an isolated close circle mystery, but. Um, <laughs> um it's sort of like no one really leaves the island much and yeah it's a sort of smaller circle of people than some of their other casts yeah so yeah should we talk about the characters um should we start with faith yeah um oh, she's so interesting like i said i said at the beginning it's like i think she's like kind of the nastiest of francis harding's main characters at least that we've reread so far but I don't really blame her for it. I don't know. Like she can be awful sometimes, but I think it's in believable ways. And I like that, like, she's really, she's really um, <laughs> not a fan of her mother for like the vast majority of this book, but I appreciate that that is like commented on and we see her start to understand her better by the end of the book. So it's not just like she's being like rude for no reason. She also suffers, you know, a serious loss during this book. And then the way that she has a complicated relationship with that person, I think also makes her reactions very believable. Like, I don't know, but then also like she can be very nasty, but she also is still, there's, there's still a lot of things that she's not willing to do um, that she thinks are wrong. Like we see when she multiple times, she like, <laughs> puts herself in trouble or danger because of that like really rude maid they have who like mm -hmm. arguably ruins a lot of things and faith is like i hate that i'm always standing up for you i don't even like you <laughs> um so i feel like there's enough stuff like that that like she doesn't feel like a bad person to me but i do think she is like like she's very different than i think a lot of Frances harding's other main characters mm. so yeah, I agree with everything you said. I sort of, I liked her fine, but not like every other book, every other live show we've been like, I love this main character. I will protect them with my life. And I don't feel that about Faith at all. Yeah. Um, but I did like her overall. And yeah, like you said, I felt sorry for her 
um and i i don't know i had sort of mixed feelings about her and i thought yeah the way that she defends is so insistent on defending her father and hates her mother was so sad um because yeah, i hated her father i'm sure we'll get to him but oh my god um yeah but i don't know i feel sort of I couldn't quite tell. I don't know if the book ever says how old she is, but I feel like I wasn't I think, sure. I think she's 14. And I think that, yeah, it's like, I think that the I book does a really good potentially job. Potentially slightly like, older than some of the other main characters. I'd say this book is more firmly YA than. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. And I think like Faith in her narration and like the book even talks about how like at this time period, she's in this really uncomfortable, like no man's mm -hmm. land because she's not really a kid anymore, but she's not like a young lady. So she's just kind yeah. of like drifting in the middle. And sometimes she's treated as one and sometimes she's treated as the other. Um, yeah, and I really, yes, Erin, um, she is. Yeah, and I really, I did feel for her in the way that she's caught between, like in even her mother, treats her as both at different times. Um, yeah. And that is really difficult. Um, yeah. Do we want to talk about Myrtle or do we want to save that for the spoiler section? I don't know, yeah, I don't really know how much more I have. That's not right. spoilery. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> Erasmus definitely will be in the spoiler section. Yes. Um, I guess we could, we could do general thoughts on Myrtle if you want. Like we don't have to refer mm -hmm. to specific things that are said or happen. Um, yeah, I, I thought she was a really interesting character. Of course, I had the benefit, both of us did, of having read this before. So we kind of know why Myrtle is doing what she's doing. Um, and I feel like she's a great example of, like, Faith and Myrtle are very different ways that women could try and find power in this time period. Um, Myrtle is, like, using her beauty and using her charm and using the, like, acceptable like characteristics um, to, to do the best she can. And it was really frustrating seeing Faith not get that. Mm. But I, like, I understand though why it's like, I'm, I'm annoyed at Faith, but I'm also like, yeah, that makes sense why you would do that. But also why are you doing that? Um, so I, I really liked Myrtle actually. I thought she was a very interesting character. Um, I think she's like one of the most complex like side characters. What? Well, I don't know if I'd say that. I like, I think a lot of the side characters are complex, but I think she's one that especially interests me because obviously I always love a subversion of the like feminine girls aren't as strong trope so yeah yeah anyone saying that as a subverted historical fiction um, yes yeah 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 I felt the same about Myrtle like she's clearly much more intelligent than she pretends to be mm -hmm. um and she is, she's doing what she has to to survive. And I understand that, but equally she's awful to Faith. Um, yeah. And she doesn't, I feel like it's only after things fall apart that she's clear with Faith that like, this is how life is. Whereas if she'd been open with that, about that from earlier on, they wouldn't have had so much conflict. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and the parts too where like, it feels like Myrtle is like willfully misunderstanding Faith. And like, I think a lot of their personal conflict with each other could have been averted if Myrtle had just listened to what Faith was trying to tell her. Cause like, I mean, we it's interesting because like in this book, we kind of see Faith acting out of character for the whole time, you know, based on what we know about her before. She's like the very good, quiet girl and everything. And she kind of snaps in this book, but so, so it's not that she's like super good at standing up for herself before this, but there are several times where she is trying to explain to Myrtle like what she wants or why she feels the way she does. And her mom is just like not ready to hear it. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely is like Myrtle brings <laughs> quite a bit of this conflict on herself, especially since like she's the parent, she's the adult, she should be the one like, I, I think it's more understandable that Faith wouldn't, like, volunteer this information. So Myrtle should kind of be the one who's, like, reaching out and trying to understand her daughter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Julia, I had no idea that that was an addition that was illustrated by I, I forgot that until you said it just now. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen that cover. That makes sense. Chris Riddell makes a lot of sense to illustrate this book. <laughs> 
Um, and anyone saying one of the only Francis Harding books that doesn't do parents well. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, like, the parents in Cuckoo Song are pretty terrible as well for a lot of the book. Um, That's true. But I'm thinking of, like, Violet as, like, adoptive mom figure, <laughs> who's great. But... Yeah, it's true. I feel like part of why I was so frustrated with this book was that Faith never has any allies. And my favourite part of every Francis Harding book is when the main character, like, joins up with their group of, of, you know, whoever that might be. And in this book, there just wasn't any of that. So, yeah, I think I always start off a bit frustrated with the, like, initial pacing. But the, like, after we get to that point, everything else makes it worth it. Whereas in this book, there was nothing that made it worth it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she arguably has like one ally in this book, and most of the time they hate each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not sure it was the same time. I mean, I could Cuckoo Song is right after World War One, and this yeah. one is like 18... 1860s. So I guess it's yeah, within mid- 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess it's closer than a lot of her other books are, especially because these are her two most historical Mm, i think it's interesting that they were published like successively yeah she clearly was interested in history when she (laughs) in those family years yes yeah and i think is a skin full of shadows real historical setting as well that one is but that one is like way farther in the past actually let me english civil war right it's yeah it's english civil war and it's like older than either of her other historical ones, like older time period, I mean. This is good because I'll need to show it when we talk about it anyway. Um, It doesn't actually say on the back, but I know it was, yeah, it's like English Civil War and I know specifically it was like, um, it might have been around like the dissolution of the monasteries as well. Mm-hmm. I remember saying Charles I, which would have been about that. Yeah. So that's interesting because this one is like much further back than her other mm-hmm. historicals. Yeah. I, really interesting. Okay. Do you have anything more to say before we go into spoilers? I don't think so. I think that's pretty much it. Okay, in that case, um, if you have to leave, thank you for coming. Um, we're glad to have seen you, and we hope you come back after you've finished. The- <laughs> yes, let us know how it goes when you're done. <laughs> but, okay, so what did you think of Erasmus, apart from... <laughs> yeah. uh, I hate this man. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um yeah, like this is this is one of the things that that makes it hard rereading this one because I just hate him so much and Faith loves him so much and I'm like Faith, no, <laughs> like he's the worst. You deserve better. Your whole family deserves better. Um, like really, the only thing I can sympathize with him is like his like his need to know like the answer to that to these questions about like evolution and everything. Like I think that makes sense. Um, especially as I've been saying multiple times, like because of this time period, it would have felt like an either or situation. So I, I, I feel for him there, but everything like about the way he treats his family and like some of the things that he says to Faith, I just, yeah. Uh, since we're in the spoiler section now, I guess I could say not that sad when he dies. Like, uh, yeah. So um, not, not a fan of Erasmus. Yeah. <laughs> Zero out of 10 would not recommend it's the way it's the way he tells her she's nothing and then turns around and makes her help him immediately in the yes. same room in the same conversation and she does yes. it yes because he realizes he's like oh i've just like completely destroyed her se- her self esteem and her sense of self and she loves me so i can make her hide whatever i want her to this is perfect <laughs> like uh yeah I ju- yeah like there are some there are some Francis Harding villains where they're terrible people, but they're still interesting to read about. And this, like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I hate him so much. Yeah. Um, like, I, I love the moment where Faith, like, stands up to, to him. Um, 
and she's like, I am clever, you know, like I, I learned Greek and Latin when I was Howard's age and like all of this. And then like right after that is when he just says the most like horrible, just like despicable things to her. So it's, it's like, you don't really get many good moments with him. Like none, really. <laughs> yeah. And after he dies, all we find out is more terrible. <laughs> He's even worse than you thought. Yeah. He like left someone for dead. Like, Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's the reveal when we find out that he fakes the fossil that Faith found. Um, it's just heartbreaking. That's the, like the one moment she ever thought she had with him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that, yeah, I think that's why I was even more upset that she and Myrtle didn't get on. Like, Myrtle's at least trying. <laughs> In her own misguided way. Right. It's like she at least is not telling you that you are a waste of space and money and food. Like, yeah. Yeah. I really thought, like, in the scene where Myrtle and Faith argue about Uncle Miles, and I really, I didn't really remember the plot in great detail, and I really thought they might, like, make up there and that Myrtle might help her, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah okay do we want to talk about paul yeah he was one of my favorites um he he and faith scenes are some of my favorites because they're both awful in similar ways <laughs> but also again for very understandable reasons like i mean paul almost lost one of his friends because her father is terrible but also like that doesn't mean you should take it out on his daughter who had nothing to do with it mm -hmm. um but yeah, I thought Paul was a super interesting character. I I really do think that most of my favorite scenes were when they were together, just because the way they play off of each other is so fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I remember from when I read this before, I don't know if it was the first time or not, but like I remember being struck by like the moment when um, she like pulls him into her room and hides him. And they have that moment of like, oh God, this could ruin like both of us. This is terrible. Because I that moment sticks out to me because like, I've read a lot of historical fiction and classics, but this was like the strongest moment where I actually felt how dangerous this was, you know, cause normally it's just like brushed off and like the characters move on or whatever. But like, I was genuinely like scared for both of them. I was like, oh no, this could like, this could go really badly. So I just, I think that um, their scenes together were written really, really well. So, and I, I like that Paul does eventually become kind of her only accomplice, her only ally. Um, yeah. I, I forgot that part where he actually finds the cave. So when she shows up, I'm like, oh my God, what? So that was a fun time. Yeah, yeah. And I, I really like the scene where she's like telling him, he, like, why are you telling me this? And she's like, well, I've decided to trust you. Like, I'm all in now. I have no choice. <laughs> he's, he's like, you just pointed a gun at me, but you trust me to like stand guard over you while you're unconscious. And she's like, yeah. <laughs> Wild, yeah. Oh my God, the part where... The part where like he says, I'll make the picture for you if you like pull out a rat from this bag and she does it. He's like, oh my God, no, I didn't mean you to. And she's like, give me another rat. Like Faith lost it. Um, I mean, she was also like a high on the mm. lie tree fruit. So she wasn't quite herself, but um, yeah, I think Paul's a little scared of her. <laughs> yeah, and I, when she was like, I'll write to you, but why? <laughs> I know there's also the implication that her mom might try to marry his dad which i'm like i have questions <laughs> yeah do like thoughts on any of the other islanders i feel like they weren't as well developed as some of her side characters are um i don't know if i really have particular thoughts on any of the others but if you have thoughts on any of them like Mr. Lambent, Dr. Jaffers, Mr. Clay, any of the women. Yeah. Um, yeah, I also, like, I think that the more prominent supporting characters were really interesting. Like, we talked about, like, Paul and Myrtle. But, yeah, I think the, the background characters weren't as complex as usual. Um, the only things I really have are, like, plot-related that I'm sure we'll get into. But, yeah, I'm trying to think if I have any other... 
I don't know. I think Dr. Jacklers was like a great example of somebody who's like a very nice and friendly person and also a horrible bigot, like, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, which Faith recognizes. So I think he was like very well written as like that kind of person. But yeah, I think that's pretty much the extent. Yeah, of they, felt, they felt more like props for the mystery rather than yeah. the characters. I kind of felt like. Yeah. And Wynn also loved the dynamic with yes. Paul and Faith I wanted to share. Um, and then do you want to talk about, A, when I know you loved Howard. I don't know if sorry, you have any <laughs> thoughts about Howard. Or I, you want to share. Yeah, I felt for him. Um, I also loved him. But then I also had moments like, kind of like Faith, I guess, where it's like everyone is treating you like you're already in charge. And this is so frustrating. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yes, I did. I did really love Howard. I felt for him also. And um I mean, the way that he is, like the the left-handed thing, you know, the way that is treated at this time period. And obviously he lost somebody just like Faith did. Um, and he has even, like, because he's so young, he has even less understanding of, like, what happened. So um, I liked him and Faith's relationship as well. I think it was a really good, like, I, I think it was very clear that Faith, like, really does love him. Like, she talks about it at the end, how she's very kind to her brother. Um but then there's also that moment sometimes of like, why does he get something so easily that I have to like fight my whole life for? So I think both of those things were balanced really well. Mm, yeah, I felt like I really, I I liked him, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but I, I did find him frustrating in some moments. He felt quite spoiled and young and he he's six, so he's not a baby. Um, but he like all the times where he like needs faith. I found him frustrating at times, but I did really like him overall. And the moments where he's like the ghost, I need to shoot the ghost. Is it coming back for me because I was bad? And that. Yes. Like, and when Faith realizes that it was just like an offhand comment she made, it's like, oh no, you're a good boy who copies out his, you know, his scripture right handed, you'll be fine. And like, he took that to mean like the ghost is going to get me if I don't. Yeah. I that hurt me as well. Like I had forgotten about that. So that was just a punch in the heart. Yeah. Although the, um, the, like the wise man in the theater, the, or I listened to part of this on audio, but only a tiny bit. And the accent that the narrator did for that was really orientalist. And I wasn't. A fan. Yeah. Yeah. I can, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, yeah, that wise man scene was interesting because, um, well, it's one of the quotes I marked that I'm sure we'll talk about, but like when Faith talks about how, like, he, Howard used to look to her for everything, for answers on everything, and now he'll just say things like, girls don't know about that. And it's like, that was what, like, I, I, I was so angry on Faith's behalf. Um, so even though I like Howard, I like, I love Howard, and it's not his fault exactly, because like, he's six, he's not like choosing to be like, you know, steeped in misogyny or anything, but it was still so frustrating to be like, to, to see, to see how it starts so young. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And like Owen is saying, the fact that he um, trashed his favorite toy because it upset Faith, yeah. like you can tell that he does still really love Faith. He does. Um, and he doesn't, obviously he doesn't understand like the way he's being socialized. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, shall we talk about the lie tree was sort of a character itself. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyone saying the pages of scribble cutting? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, the lie tree. Very creepy. <laughs> uh, like the way that it is like semi personified, I think was was very effective like when faith talks about how she gets the impression that it likes her mm -hmm. and that makes her happy and i'm reading this like <laughs> yeah and like when she's so possessive over it when mrs winterborn comes to see it what's it, agatha um, yeah and she's like no i don't want it to like her i want it to like me yeah even as she's in danger for her life she's like upset <laughs> like somebody else yeah um and i i also 
I didn't remember this. This is, I guess this is like a little detail, but I didn't remember that like the whispering that she hears are actual lies, like things that the tree has. Like I remember that from one of the cover designs, but I didn't remember that was actually in the book. So that was a really interesting moment. Like when the tree is like huge, it's taking up the whole cavern and she's walking through and hearing all these lies that people have told. Like, I thought that was very interesting, very effective moment in the book. <laughs> Yeah, um, and like the fact that it burns when it's exposed to light. Um, That's a good point. That's very symbolic. I didn't think about that. But yeah, yeah. And do we want to talk about, I guess, now when, while we're on it, like truth, the theme of truth and lies more generally? Yeah. Um, I thought it was really interesting that at the end, Faith has that moment of like, I don't actually know if it is telling I forget how she says it, but basically that the lie tree could just be saying things that they already suspected themselves, which I think is interesting because I don't know if I agree with that. Like, it seems like some of the information she got is something that she wasn't suspecting herself, but mm -hmm. I do think that's an interesting idea. Um, and I also, I liked how at the beginning, I mean, for a good chunk of the book, Faith is like, well, I'm just like, I'm just starting these rumors. People are the ones choosing to act on them, which is true, but she also does feel responsible when like, um, I forget the postmistress's name, but she, like her house gets burned down and it's like, Faith's like, I didn't do that, but like, she, she still feels like she was involved, you know, mm -hmm. like, I think that was really interesting. Like this idea that, um, obviously words are not harmless and even if other people are responsible for their actions which they are like you still that doesn't mean you get to say whatever you want um yeah yeah i would say i feel fruit drew from her subconscious yeah well it was interesting like because the, the dreams were clearly taking things from her memories yes um, but i like for a moment as well when we just read erasmus's diaries i kind of wondered if the fruit causes the the like effects because he was saying I dreamed that I like had burning in my toes and then he got gout and for a moment I was like did the did it give him gout oh that's interesting which doesn't necessarily work with the rest of it after when faith eats it but for a moment I had that because that would also be yeah that's interesting. And I, I think for the reason I wasn't necessarily convinced by the subconscious thing is because I was thinking of like the the dream she has with the dinosaurs that makes her figure out that there were two people involved in the murder. That was something where I'm like, how would you have an instinct about that, though? You know, like how would like we didn't see her investigating in a way that seemed to suggest that, which I guess that's the point of the subconscious is that you're not like thinking about it all the time. But I guess I just thought from the perspective of like reading a book about it, that there would be maybe some more clues for that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, the thing with her uncle Miles as well, like that's something that we didn't see her distrusting him, but there were kind of suggestions that it's like, wait, why did he want them to come here so much, you know? So yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, well, I think the interpretation was interesting as well because like I, from the dream that she had about the dinosaurs, my, like my conclusion wouldn't have been oh there were two people involved i know I, I was like what how did you get there i was still trying to figure out what like this even meant and she's like oh yes there were two murderers um so i guess in that sense awen maybe she did on some level know it if she was able to interpret it like that um yeah i don't know but yeah and like you were saying i thought that the depiction of like how quickly lies can spread and how dangerous how quickly they can get really dangerous um was really effective yeah like when she tells um jean jayon i'm not sure how mm -hmm. her name <laughs> would be pronounced um but like everything that happens with her because she thinks she's being haunted by a ghost and then that was interesting because as soon as faith told the truth that did kind of fix it you know that did i mean didn't fix things for faith <laughs> but like i thought that was an interesting contrast because i think a lot of the damage is not fixable but i think this was an, an interesting example of like sometimes it isn't too late to do something so you should still you know tell the truth because it might make mm -hmm. a big difference 
Yeah, and I like that the book also pointed out that like Faith didn't feel better straight away after that, mm -hmm. um, but it was still the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then we've talked a little bit about, about the, we've talked a little bit about the feminism already, um, but do we want to um, touch on that again? Yeah, like you said, it was quite a lot more obvious than a lot of the themes. Yeah, and I, this might just be like more down to personal taste, I guess, than anything, because like, I can't argue with the, with it being realistic, you know, because it is, and especially for the time period, and especially for what Faith wanted to do with her life, which is being a natural scientist, like, nothing that happens in this book is like, oh, that's unbelievable, you know, that wouldn't have happened. I just think like, because we've read her, her other books, so it's just we're used to it being a lot more subtle, I think. Um, I, I do think this book gets a little more nuanced near the end because we do get that development for Myrtle or like we get to understand her better or Faith does. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is kind of one of those examples where it's like, I don't disagree with anything you said, but I just think you could have said it, <laughs> uh, I don't know, more subtly or like more, like it could have been integrated into the story better, I think. Um, I do though, I do really like the way that the mystery plays into that because I know the first time I read this, I have very clear memories of being completely blindsided by who the killer was. And that is something, I think that's another thing that made me think of this book as one of my favorites is because something that always really, really impresses me in books is when you're fooled by the same thing that the character is and you don't even realize it until the end. Because I also had glossed over that reference to the Winterborns staying at a hotel, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like, so that was something that, like the, the way that that plays into the mystery, I think even if it is kind of not obvious, but even if it's a very direct example, is like, look, when you forget about women, this is what happens. Um, I still think that was very effective. So sometimes, sometimes the obvious thing I think worked. Um, and there's the part at the end too, where even though Agatha is like a horrible person, um, Faith is thinking about how like she's being erased, you know, like she was awful, but she was still a person and she's just getting kind of like absorbed into her husband's like memory and history. So yeah, I guess I have mixed feelings <laughs> about the way the feminism is handled. Yeah. Anyone saying Uncle Miles reminds me of Uncle Ralph from the lives of Christopher Chant? I've never heard of that. I, so I it's a Diana Wynne Jones book and I have read it but it's been a while I think I know who you're talking about though and I agree <laughs> if it's the character I'm thinking of yeah we didn't really talk about Uncle Miles um I don't know if you have anything particular to say uh just that he's um, a great example of like he plays nice until you don't give him what he wants and then he's like oh yeah you you were never <laughs> like you were never really a good person or planning to take care of people like um the way that he like has no compunctions about using his power as a man over the women in this family is like yeah not a fan of uncle miles <laughs> yeah and the way he's like instantly the moment that erasmus dies he's like yes i want all his, his papers and all of his property yes. and like, literally he's not even been buried <laughs> yeah. yeah and he's he's like pretending it's to take care of them like yeah he, does, he doesn't even have the decency to be like I'm in charge now give me everything he's like I want to protect you because you're so you're so upset and womanly <laughs> you need my help and then when he has that conversation with Faith that like your mother's really upset we don't need to worry her about this yeah which is like always a red flag anytime an adult tells you not to tell an another adult something it's generally not a good sign yeah, yeah. So yeah, so but going back to what you're saying about the feminism. Yeah, I agree. It was just very like, I feel for every second page, there was like, women aren't allowed to do it. I was like, yes, I understand. <laughs> I got it. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think I did. I did when they were setting the plot um, for when she and Paul were at the mine at the end. Um, I knew it wasn't that way around, but only because I have finally got to the front and starting stage. I was like, no, if she thinks it's that way around, it's not going yeah. to be <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I do agree. Yeah, and I thought the way that she got to the conclusion about 
that was quite abrupt as well. Like I wouldn't, a bit like the two people in the dream thing, like she was suddenly like, oh, she's in the Paris Register and so clearly she was the wife. Like that's a quite big conclusion to jump to. Yeah, like I guess because she found, she found the record saying that Agatha Winterborn married um what's his name lambent so like yeah. she did see her name there yeah but she was yeah. already looking for that when she went to see the right. record and like because she was so she had the dream about her father leaving mr winterborn to die and immediately she was like i guess that was the motive but like <laughs> yeah no that's a that's a good point yeah i felt like that too because she the when her and paul are planning to look at the register she like you said she already knows what she's looking for and that was kind of a moment a moment where I was like, wait, like I get why you would I don't know, I get why you'd be suspicious, but yeah, she already she already knew. <laughs> um I mean I guess I guess there's not that many there wouldn't have been that many like English explorers in that part of the world at the same time, but yeah. Some very impressive uh deductive reasoning, I guess. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, and we talked a little bit about religion at the beginning. Um, I don't know if we want to go over it particularly, but yeah, it just I like. I feel like some of the characters have a, you know, is what does the tree represent? But I feel like the book comes down pretty clearly on the fact that religion doesn't exist. Um, I don't know if I loved that. Yeah, I. Yeah, I, I also don't feel like we got, like, confirmation of what the tree was or what it meant, um, which I don't necessarily think has to do with with the way religion is handled. But, yeah, I think one of the things that frustrates me about the way it's handled in this book is that even though this is set in a very particular time when that makes that discussion makes a lot more sense, I think a lot of people still act like this is happening you know and that is like frustrating to me mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's hard for me to come to this book and not think about how people would how people like um use this like dichotomy this false dichotomy mm -hmm. in current day especially because it is a book for children yeah and it's that's one of the other reasons why in one way it doesn't surprise me that this is the book that won the award because this kind of thing tends to and that also goes along with like the the very obvious feminism is <laughs> like um which again, like, I don't disagree with the obvious feminism, but it's just like, I think there are certain kinds of themes that when when the books are very popular, they're usually the ones that don't handle them with a lot of nuance. Um, at least that's something I feel like I've noticed. Um, yeah, I guess kind of just what we've been talking about. Yeah. And I also, I think too, the vision that Erasmus has, like the last one that like makes him, like, you know, feel like he, you know, question everything. That was interesting because I don't think that vision actually says either way. You know, I think that it is clearly a representation of evolution, but I think Erasmus is the one who took that to mean if this is true, this other thing can't be, which like, I, that I think is a more I don't know, balanced perspective. Um, yeah, it's it's like some of it, some of it is like, I guess, murky about what it's saying, which I guess goes along with like the, the feeling of the book about like not really knowing, you know, what's, what's being said, but. Yeah, I guess it depends how you feel about the tree. Um, like Ewan was saying, and like, I think there's a, an attempt at balance because there's the bit where Brian is his name Brian when he says like is it the tree of Eden um oh yes uh what was his name Ben I think Ben, ben. yeah <laughs> Brian <laughs> I thought it was B I couldn't remember either for his um but I felt like yeah it depends because if it's if the tree is telling you what's in your subconscious then maybe Erasmus just didn't believe in God anymore and the dream mm -hmm. is just telling him that but if it's off if it's actually telling you the truth I think it did because he like the evolution bit is one thing, but then he like he goes to find God and God's not there. Oh, I, I felt like the book was 
I don't know, I in the way I read it, the book felt like it was quite clear about that. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah, I think I wasn't like as far as like where the tree comes from or where it represents, for some reason, I wasn't thinking of that in connection with the themes. I was like, I know the characters do, but like when Ben is talking about if it could be uh, from Eden, that wasn't necessarily something I considered one way or the other. Um, yeah. It is interesting, like the, obviously the way these visions can be interpreted, there's a lot of different ways, which is why the characters all have difficulties, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's also because I've read another short story by Frances Harding where she, I also wasn't a fan of her portrayal of religion and possibly that's soured me a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know. I think that's, that interpretation is a fairly large part of why I didn't love the book overall, mm -hmm. so, which yeah. Everything is subjective. <laughs> um, but yeah, okay, general other points. Okay, I have one more question, which is, what was the significance of Fate's Pet Snake? <laughs> now we get to the big stuff. Um, <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I love, I love the image of like, her running out and scaring Paul with this snake wrapped all around her shoulders and he's like, ah! <laughs> so I love that. Um, I think I think the snake also was kind of like, I guess kind of like Faith's relationship with Howard. It's like, we see that she is a caring person, you know? Like she can be awful, but she can also be very kind. Um, like she's, I was also, I was scared that the snake had died. Like I was pretty mm -hmm. sure he hadn't because I didn't remember that from reading it before. But when she's like, she has that moment of like thinking that because she's been so obsessed with the lie tree that like the snake has died. So I feel like that's kind of, it shows that she's, you know, her humanity, her empathy. Um, she's a cool Victorian <laughs> girl with a snake. That's right. I'm not like other girls. <laughs> I have a trinket snake in my back, in my bedroom. Um, that was very smart of her to hide her father's papers under the mm. snake. Very smart. Um, yeah, I feel like the snake was just kind of like, just for funsies. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like every book has a random motif. In Vertigo Deep, it was the shopping trolleys. I was like, I don't understand what these are doing here. What does this symbolize, Francis? What does this mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no. Also, I was impressed when Mrs. Vele said, like, he's just shedding his skin. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> How did you know that? Mrs. Vele was one of my, I think, she doesn't get that much page time, but she was one of the side characters I really liked because she's just very much like, nothing phases me. I will do my job. Like that part where Faith is like, I guess she's okay with providing dead rodents, but she doesn't want to leave them out there. <laughs> like, so it's like in a little- Let's talk about it. She puts it in like a little bottle. It's like, here's your dead rodent <laughs> out your door. Like, um, yeah. <laughs> I wish the snake had a name. I feel like mm. it should have, but. But yeah. And did you want to talk about some of your favorite moments? I know we've talked about them, some of them already, but you said that it wasn't your favorite book anymore, but you still had some of your favorite moments. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Like just like very memorable parts or like, like I would, like we were talking about with um, her and Paul's scenes is like where that moment where they both realize like, this would be really bad for both of us. It's not like that's a, fun moment because they're scary but like that just has really stuck in my mind as like a really great example of how you can make historical fiction feel very like immediate because like you can you can make modern readers like understand what this would have meant in a very like visceral way um so that was one I also um like honestly most of their scenes together I like just really stand out to me like the scene at the the rat baiting or the dog whatever that was um she's like give me another rat like that's just like uh i think that's a very defining character moment for faith but it's also a very interesting scene um i also i mean i'm sure we'll get to quotes i have like quite a few quotes shared but um let me see what some of my other scenes. yeah no i thought the rat the actual ratting scene was really interesting as well because faith um faith is so like nihilistic about everything and like life has no meaning and then she realizes that she was like high on the light tree um yeah and so like 
the tree it's not just <coughs> it's not just about the lies it's also like her humanity and her like it's affecting kind of her entire worldview yeah like i really like the part after that that you're talking about where she's like how could she ever have thought life was only teeth or something like that like yeah um i thought that as well and just like some of the some of the images like i remember that like final i don't know confrontation with the tree i the first time <laughs> i think it was the first time i read this book maybe it must have been if i didn't know how it was going to end but um this was before I knew that like you weren't supposed to buy arcs because I had found like an arc in like a used bookstore of this book and the last few pages were missing. So like the book that copy ended when Faith like goes into the water and I'm like, does she drown? <laughs> but I was able to like get an actual copy of the book later, which I had been planning to do anyway. And so I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> the book actually ends. So I, I wonder if that's one of the reasons why that like final like, like battle, <laughs> it really stands in my mind is I was like, oh yeah, that time I thought the book ended with Faith just drowning, <laughs> like, <laughs> but. Yeah, okay, should we do quotes? Is there anything that anyone wants to say before we move into quotes? What? If not, you can go ahead. Okay. So this is one of those where like the feminism is very obvious, but also this is true and it's a good line. <laughs> uh, there was a hunger in her and girls were not supposed to be hungry. They were supposed to nibble sparingly when at table and their minds were supposed to be satisfied with a slim diet too. A few stale lessons from tired governesses, dull walks, unthinking pastimes, but it was not enough. All knowledge, any knowledge, called to faith, and there was a delicious, poisonous pleasure in stealing it unseen. Mm -hmm. It's like we could have done that a little more subtly, but you're not wrong. Like, <laughs> yeah, I've got um, choose a lie that others wish to believe was written beneath it. They will cling to it, even if it is proven false before their face. If anyone tries to show them the truth, they will turn on them and fight them tooth and nail. Which feels worryingly still rather <laughs> um I there were also there were a few like funny moments which was nice because overall this is a pretty dark book not that her books mm. aren't usually but um when Faith is getting trying to get alone with her father's like strong box and she's like oh could you just leave and she doesn't even say like that she needs to change her clothes so she can dry off she just kind of like implies it and <laughs> he says ah of course Clay looked a little alarmed, as gentlemen often did when something mysterious involving female clothing was in danger of happening. <laughs> like, I really do like how Faith is like, she's not afraid to use the, I don't know, the like dumb stereotypes or whatever. It's like, she's willing to do that if it gets her what she wants, which she doesn't realize her mom also does. Yeah. <laughs> Later. More similar than she realizes. Um, yeah, Awen's shared. Large people tend to have large heads. Men are no cleverer than we are, Miss Huntley. Just took her. Yes. That was another moment I remembered is that conversation with um, the postmistress. I really liked that. Yeah. I also liked while we're on Myrtle. Um, Today, Myrtle was waxen with tiredness and shrouded to the chin with shawls. But as usual, she talked through and over everybody else, warm, bland, and unabashed, with a pretty woman's faith in other heads, helpless chivalry. Yep. <laughs> Okay. Oh, this one. Okay. Really. Even without Uncle Miles's warning, Faith would have known that a storm was breaking as soon as she entered the house. Quiet people often have a weather sense that loud people lack. They feel the wind changes of conversations and shiver in the chill of unspoken resentments. Yeah. Like I Yeah, I feel that in my soul. Like <laughs> Uh, like I sometimes like I don't understand how sometimes like other people don't pick up on stuff like that you know so let's see oh this is like after her father is like horrible one of the times um her self-respect had suffered a head-on collision with love a clash that generally only ends one way love does not fight fair 
In that moment, her pride, the gut knowledge that she was right, even her sense of who she was, meant nothing, faced as she was with the prospect of being unloved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, anyone's saying, um, how would shot things to make the world feel safer? Yeah. Poor Howard. Like that was one of the only things he like knew. <laughs> like you understand how he made that connection. Um, Faith thought that it must be very relaxing being Dr. Jackler's deaf to the crunch of other people's feelings beneath his well-intentioned boots. <laughs> yeah. I also had, um, in this state of bedazzlement, I found myself a traveller in the country of my own body, my veins red gold and fierce as lava streams, my spine a mountain rich, my lungs catacombs. I travelled all the way down to the promontory of my left big toe and there discovered simmering noxious green lakes that turned my stomach. Like, I felt like that was the Frances Harding writing. Yes, that makes me think of when she's describing Caverna in yeah. like Glass. Yeah. Oh, this is from one of, this is from the... The ratting scene and it's not even that the, the line itself is so special but i just remember i don't know it stood out in like the context of what was happening when she goes if you like dare so much paul clay she said then come i dare you and i'm like oh my god faith has gone off the rails <laughs> um oh because i think she's this is yeah this is when she's got the snake wrapped all around her so it's not the ratting this is when she has the snake around her and she's like come and get like her father's hair that he was dared to get um yeah and it, it's the same scene where they're like he's like takes the hair from her but he doesn't want to get too close and he <laughs> i was like faith is kind of being a badass here <laughs> like um okay let's see i have oh this is a line from myrtle which is another like I feel like this one doesn't feel as heavy-handed because she's like explaining to Faith like how can you not get this she said this is a battlefield Faith women find themselves on battlefields just as men do we are given no weapons and cannot be seen to fight but fight we must or perish so that's mm -hmm. it's and Faith like when her mom is explaining this to her it's like she doesn't want to admit that she misjudged her so her response is like I don't know she's like refusing to admit that she was that she understands her more now. Yeah, I've got on the same like heavy handed feminism. I have sort of mixed feelings about this one, but um, Faith's clothes were tyrants. She could not step across a dusty road, brave the rain, sit in a wicker chair or lean against a whitewashed wall without something becoming damaged, gathering dirt, wearing smooth or losing its stiffening. Her garments were always one misstep away from becoming a source of guilt. Eliza had to spend hours brushing the mud out of your hem, which like, it does make more work for Eliza. <laughs> like, it's not Faith's fault. Um, yeah. But it, like, it does make more work for someone else when you're getting your clothes dirty. Right, right. Like, she does acknowledge that, but that's not really what she's <laughs> what she's thinking about. She's like, oh, man, when I ruin my clothes, people know what I've been doing. It's like, yes, also. <laughs> Somebody has to fix them for you. Um, oh, I thought the moment where Faith understands what's going on with Mrs. Vellet or Vellet and Miss Hunter was nice. It was like in the midst of all this horrible stuff happening, it was a nice little moment. Um, and that flash of a smile was enough for Faith to understand that Mrs. Vellet was not dry and Miss Hunter was not cold and to sense a moment of rightness, like two notes in a chord, the tiniest fragment of a melody that she did not understand. It's like, she doesn't know exactly, but she gets it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on completely the opposite side, and um, when she's describing his father, um, he was he was unyielding stone and judgments carved deep. He was a place where you need where you needed to tread quietly and whisper. Yeah. Oh, this is the one we were talking about. Um, she could no longer understand the faith from the night of the ratting, who had believed that the world was only teeth and hunger, nothing but killing and dead bones in the dust. Hunger cannot unex cannot explain why I love the blue of this sky. She thought. Oh, and then this one, it's like, I love this this message and I wish we had seen more of this throughout the book, but Faith had always told herself that she was not like other ladies, but neither it seemed were other ladies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, could we have had that earlier? But <laughs> you got there in the end. Yeah. 
Yeah, I have I think that's, others. That's yeah, I think I have a few others about like her father just being the worst, <laughs> but we kind of covered that. Um, let me see if there's anything. Yeah, sorry, that was, I don't know if you heard that, but that was a really loud truck. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so this one is actually earlier in the book than I thought. Um, back in the trophy room, the gentlemen would be taking the leash off their conversation. Likewise, likewise, here in the drawing room, each lady quietly relaxed and became more real, expanding into the space left by the men. Without visibly changing, they unfolded like flowers or knives. So that's something where, like, there are there are references throughout to it's not just Faith who's, like, you know, the strong woman who knows what's going on. Um, it's just, like, in contrast to how, like, obvious the other stuff is, it's pretty subtle <laughs> until you get to the very end. Um, let's see. Yeah, I also thought like the, the scene where um, Agatha keeps them waiting when she's come to see the magistrate, which like in hindsight is about much more than mm -hmm. it being not respectable for Myrtle to be out while a widow. Um, but it's also like, it's the only avenue of like fighting back that she has to just keep them waiting in her drawing room. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I think that's... Sometimes I'm looking at a page and I'm like, why did I take a picture of this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this was, okay. <laughs> this is describing... Um, I think it was Mr. Lambent. Faith was not sure whether he had deliberately dressed this way or whether items of his collection had simply fallen on him. <laughs> okay, that might be... That might be the rest of mine. Let's see. Okay. I think that's it, yes. <laughs> Okay, so if no one has anything else, then we can just introduce the next book. Yes. Yeah, anything else anyone wants to talk about with the lie tree before we finish up? I'm like extra sad now because like this is like the special edition that they did for it winning the Costa and I'm like, the award doesn't exist anymore. So I guess I'm glad I got that, but. <laughs> Oh, one, okay. One thing I would be interested what you guys think. So we have that like reference that we talked about a little at the end where um, her mother is like possibly planning to marry Paul's dad. So like anytime something like this happens, which I don't think, like I don't think Faith and Paul were necessarily being set up as like a couple, but I do get the feeling that when they got older, that could maybe happen just because they know each other so well. And I, I don't know, I feel like this is one of those books where like, it's not overtly romantic, but if you told me it was later, I'd be like, yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. So what I wanna know is how, like, what, what do we think would happen with that? Because this, at this point in history, marrying your cousin was fine, but marrying your in-laws was like incest. So like, what i mean it could have just been like a, a like passing thought of her mother that like nothing would come of it and obviously we don't know that um faith and paul would be involved later but i just i'm wondering do you have thoughts on that it seems like this could cause problems down the road yeah i don't know i feel like on some level also well i don't know i was gonna say that paul and mr clay aren't necessarily higher class and that Michael feels like she would want Faith to marry higher but then if she's contemplating marrying Mr. Clay then maybe not. So. Yeah she's like we wouldn't even have to redecorate and Faith is like mother! <sighs> yeah so I just and I always have this thought anytime this because this happens in stories sometimes where there's like the like the younger generation of characters and then the older ones and if they both are possibly interested in each other 
especially in a historical setting, I'm always like, uh, <laughs> how would this work? <laughs> Just wondering. Eowyn, I'm kind of glad to hear you say that because this was my least favorite, A Skin Full of Shadows, um, which is why I'm hosting it. Like Hannah was saying, we each picked our least favorite to host because we thought that would be just an interesting way to do it. And at least, this is one I've only read once, but when I read it, it was my least favorite from her. So yeah, I I don't anticipate that changing, but we'll see, <laughs> maybe. Um, yeah, so A Skin Full of Shadows is our next selection and that we don't know when that live show will be it'll probably be close to the end of july we're thinking um but obviously like follow our social media and everything um for like updates about that um yeah i haven't read this one before so now that you both didn't like it now <laughs> <laughs> You're kind of like, oh no yeah well i i feel like it would be difficult for me to like a france harding book less than i like this one so I'm yeah. hoping that I would like it better than you two did I think part of it like I know for me like part of it is definitely just like personal preference and like the kinds of stories like I based on this synopsis I never would have picked it up if it wasn't by one of my favorite authors so I don't necessarily think it's like written worse or anything um oh Julia it's a skin full of shadows if I can put it in the actual front of the camera there we go um so that's what our next one is going to be, which is also a historical one, Julia. I know that you're a fan of that. Um, yeah, anyone saying, I think it will go up in my estimation. So far that's happened to me with pretty much all of the others except this one. So. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's encouraging, Awen. then. Maybe, maybe I'll like it more as well, especially if I know how certain things are gonna go. Um, yeah. Okay. Eowyn, what do you think about the Paul situation? I want to know what your opinion is. How do you think that would go? I'm nosy. <laughs> and I also like, I was saying, I might be reading too much into it. I'm not saying that is what would happen, but I do get the feeling it could. And that's just something that I feel could cause an issue later on. Um, yeah. Other than that, anything else i'm waiting for anyone's answer if she has one not to put you on the spot i'm sorry i'm like am i the only one who's bothered by the potential <laughs> conflict later uh, i also get the feeling too that i mean like faith is saying that she doesn't know how she could ever like have something like this happen because um she's like what man would like want me to be like going on digs and all of that and i'm like what <laughs> yeah I definitely think we're not supposed to know I was wondering if anyone had a prediction or an opinion or something they wanted to happen um I just yeah Paul and Faith would be an interesting couple because it's like you're awful in like the same ways <laughs> but also not <laughs> yeah but I think they would drive each other I'm not you sure would. they would have a happy marriage <laughs> No, that's that's probably true. I think they'd be, yeah. If they could, on the other hand, though, they started out so badly that things can only improve. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't I, think, I thought the same, but then if Myrtle's willing to marry Mr. Clay, then I feel like she would have, maybe she wouldn't have the objections that I otherwise think she might have. Yeah. I kind of get the feeling that if this did happen, if Faith did want to marry somebody later, that would pretty much, like her mom would do whatever to, because she'd be so happy. Like, oh, Faith wants to get married. I'll do whatever you want me to. So anyway, okay. That was me being nosy. <laughs> um, alrighty. I think that's everything. We will see you guys sometime next month um, for A Skin Full of Shadows. Um, I think they would be... <laughs> cousin that is another potential ending i could see yes yeah i definitely think they would th they'd stay in touch um mm -hmm. yeah they clearly like know each other better than pretty much anyone else um okay so anything yeah. to add hana i don't think so thank you for coming everyone yeah and we'll... for those who watch it back um, yes thank you for watching it back i know we have some people who catch up um and we'll see you next month
Bye.